This is Dr. Baba Kazizadeh. You are listening to the Smile Podcast, where I will be sharing with you my unique and holistic perspective on beauty, health, and wellness. Hello. <laughs> Millions of people have surgery every year. Or you could just get a boob job. Using targeted Botox can be a miracle. Smiling like that is a skill. Your there. surgery has been successful. All right, hello everybody, and this is Dr. Aziza Day, and uh, welcome to the Small Podcast. And today we have two very special guests that, uh, honestly, their stories are unbelievable, and um, we're so glad. We've been focusing the podcast on coronavirus, and we've brought a lot of doctors and healthcare providers to give you a lot of information, but today. Um, we're going to have uh, the story, a journey of a survivor, and one of one of the most honestly r- amazing journeys. Uh, so I want to welcome uh, Greg Garfield and his girlfriend AJ Johnson, and it's so great to have you guys. And welcome to the Smile Podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us. All right. So, Greg. Um, I know you've been on the Ellen show and multiple other media outlets because your story is just pretty amazing. And you've gone through, you know, uh, something that like, I would say less, even though the word 1% chance of survival is always brought up, but I really think it's actually less. Uh, And I'll tell you some of my insight on that since, you know, I, I, you know, I've been pretty active with this, you know, coronavirus, but Tell us a little bit about your journey of, you know, you were patient number zero at, um, uh, at probably in Southern California. Uh, and tell us kind of what happened and your journey uh, so that, um, you know, we can learn a little bit from you. So, um, well, thank you. Um, I was, I, I go on a uh, European ski trip every year, same group of guys anywhere between 13 to 20 guys. This was 13 guys. Um, we went to Italy and did a place called Val Gardena. Three days into the skiing, uh, I ended up getting flu-like symptoms. And um, it, it would, I, would, I missed three, three additional days of skiing. Um, if, if I were to miss skiing on a European ski trip, I'm really sick. So that's, yeah, I just didn't really feel well. In fact, when I got back, I was supposed to go on a helicopter trip three days later to go on a heliskiing trip. So I wanted to rest up for that trip. And, you know, I have what they call a hyperimmune system. So it's about as good as you can get with it, with my immunity. I'm as healthy as can be. I've never had any pre-existing conditions. Um, you know, I'm young, I'm 54 years old and you know, I, I always, if I don't feel well, I rest by two days and I'm back up and, and at it. This did not happen. So uh, at the end of the trip, the, the last day, uh, we went back to Munich. Um, a friend of one of the guys on the trip uh, ended up getting pneumonia and he was uh, admitted into the hospital the night before we left. Uh, we then left that morning. Um, prior to that, Another uh, three of the guys from Sweden left early. One of the guys that was sick also got went to the hospital. He was sent home with the flu. So we didn't have any any knowledge that we had the the coronavirus. We all thought we had the flu, and hopped on a plane that next morning. On the plane, we ended up getting a text message that said our friend was tested positive for COVID. So when we landed, I went home. I quarantined myself. Fortunately enough, AJ was not there. And uh, I called my doctor who called the CDC and ended up, they ended up sending a van out to to my house to pick me up and bring me out to their office and tested me when tests were not even around then. Yeah, no, you couldn't get it. Yeah, I mean- Early March, forget it. And no one was really looking for tests at the time. No, not at all. Out here, technically. So I ended up coming back 24 hours later, I was uh, diagnosed COVID positive. And I just basically hunkered down with my dog and just figured I would just, you know, wait, you know, wear out the storm. So AJ would drop by, you know, uh, and put uh, 
uh, soup on my table or on my, on my doorstep, you know, not getting in touch, you know, not getting in contact with me. And about three days in, I was, I got home on the first, on the morning of the fourth, I was on the phone with uh, my buddy, Doug, who then got John, our friend, John on the phone, um, who is a mutual doctor friend of ours. Who called me right after. Who called you, <laughs> exactly right. It takes a village, you yeah. know, from the start. It is, it's um, unbelievable. John got in my ear only because uh, Doug was, Doug was frustrated that I was so sick that he ended up, you know, basically tattletailing with the doctor on me. And, uh, you know, he reached out and, and was, was adamant about getting me in a hospital. Oops. And um, called all around UCLA, USC, St. Uh, St. John's, um, Cedars, and none of which would take me. And they weren't prepared for it. So they called St. Uh, St. Joe's here in Burbank. I live in Studio City, uh, which was 10 minutes away from me, convenient. And um, I said to him, I go, hold off for now. If I get... <laughs> You're like, I'm still on. holding on. Yeah, when I get when I get sicker later, or or things don't shape up, you know, I'll 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 call you and pull the trigger. So I then um, it, it happened, unfortunately, and I got a hold of him um, really early in the morning, um, and he pulled the trigger and and called St. Joe's and set it up for them to, to take me, and um, we called the ambulance together. And uh, as soon as they come, they, they came with full hazmat gear. I put my dog, my dog's crate trained. So I put my dog in her crate. And I, I prior to that, I happened to try to get her taken care of. And, it, you know, being exposed to COVID, nobody would take the liability. Oh, my God. So I looked at her and I said, girl, I'll get you out of here. Um, sit tight. And I, you know, cried and I walked out and, and I got in the ambulance I called AJ and, you know, basically said to AJ, we got to get this dog out of there. And we called the CDC. We called the vet. We called the, the hospital. Yeah, no idea. It, and none of which would take the liability to yeah. go to the house and get the dog. Because the house was contaminated yeah. for the past three days since he had been yeah. out. So then I, I took it upon myself and went into Superhero over here. <laughs> went into the hospital and got some hazmat training. And then just came and, and rescued Bear. Thankfully, did everything oh. as far as disinfecting her. And she was my lifesaver while Greg was fighting for his life. And a uh, funny story was when she extracted the dog out of here, uh, um, ended up going into my backyard and hosed down the dog with the, the proper shampoo and proceeded to lock herself in the backyard. <laughs> and she ended up scaling a 10-foot fence dressed like a, um, minion. a minion. Oh, my God. <laughs> And so she's a bit of an athlete. So needless to say, we were unfortunate that I didn't get it on my surveillance cameras. Oh, my God. Hope to. It but uh, added to the story. she was a definite superstar that saved my dog, uh, our dog, really. And, um, you know, she took her home. And really, the, 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 the next 31 days of being on the vent um, when I was in the hospital, she basically, the dog saved her life in regards to, um, you know, Just being that her. supportive factor. Yeah. Animals are silent, but boy, their heart and their love is, is pretty, pretty strong. That's, that's pretty amazing. That's really, really amazing. Now you were on the vent. Um, and for those who don't understand, basically there was a tube that was helping you breathe and you were kind of, you know, probably just completely sedated and unaware of what's going on. Um, tell us kind of the first thing you remember when you woke up from that. Was that surreal? Um, was that like kind of like what, what was the, what was that experience like for you? So first thing that happened, I really wasn't, I didn't recall that. Uh, my ICU nurse came into my room and the day before I was leaving and set, and was uh, educated me a little bit on, kind of the journey that I had with being sedated. Um, the, the, that true story of the 31 days, you know, I'll, I'll reflect to AJ to tell you that. But when every day the ICU nurse came in and she talked to me and I wasn't, I wasn't coherent, but she talked to me every day. Um, AJ had brought a little stuffed animal, my dog's named Bear, 
And this little stuffed animal was given to her by her 15 year old to give to me. And it's a little oh. named baby bear. And when she gave it to my, to my ICU nurse who tucked it under my chin and was talking to me that day. And I had tears rolling out of my eyes. Oh. And that was the first sign of me being in there. And she, she was she, really excited to give us yes. a call and say, guys, I think Greg's in there. He hasn't said anything yet. And he's not tracking, but you know, he was reacting putting bear on his cheek. So that gave us a bit of hope. Um, I will say that I don't think Greg remembers much of no. coming out of off the vent for the first week and a half or two, uh, because he was very he heavily sedated. And, um, not only that, um, but he was also on a paralytic for about two weeks while he was intubated and on the vent. And you had a tracheotomy, so, um, right? Yes. He had a tracheotomy. So which it healed. Fantastic. Yeah. Looks pretty good. It never happened. Looks pretty good. <laughs> they did a nice job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they did. So anyway, he didn't remember a whole lot. We did a few FaceTime um, sessions with him where we were able to talk to him. And initially it was him just smiling, laughing, you know, keeping eye contact. He couldn't talk at the time. He doesn't remember any of those calls. But ever since he came off the vent and I was able to be with him, I asked him if he wanted to go through some of the material. The good, what, 40 days that he was kind of not with us. Kind of, yeah. And, uh, and we went through all of them and it was really, that was really kind of what showed him what happened, but his memory is nothing until he really came out and was moved out and probably on day, I'd say 42 of being at the hospital. And AJ, I, uh, sorry to interrupt you, AJ, would they give you visitation? Would they let you go in? Because now they don't let anyone go in. And, you know, but would, would they make like an exception for you in that process? You know, um, I went in before he, they ended up quarantining because being that he was patient zero, I was able to go in three times while he was on life support. Actually, I'm sorry, two times while he was on life support. And one time the day that I went to extract bear because I had to go in for the, the hazmat training. Um, so I was able to go in at that time. And then we had a meeting with the doctors around the 11th of March. And that's when they said, you know what, guys, we're so sorry, but chances are we can't let you in here again. So we had gone in to see him, his sister and I, and, um, and his brother-in-law. And we were right outside of his door, just yelling at him, like, you know, fight, we're here, we're here, you know, and, and he was sound asleep. We thought maybe his heart rate would change or something, but nothing changed. And we didn't know if that was the last time we were going to see him. But I was allowed in um, under very special circumstances because of him being patient zero and, and him making such huge strides for how bad he was. And being patient zero at the hospital, I was there for seven days without any other COVID patients mm -hmm. in the hospital. Yeah. So they, their focus was 100% on me. They did an amazing job. And they did, they did an amazing an job. Incredible and, job. You know, incredible job. Specifically blind. I mean, they really didn't know what the protocol was. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, they did everything they could outside of the box to allow me to get my life back. And frankly, I would not have survived anywhere else, I believe, because of that attention that was so special that they gave me. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that people don't realize, it's, it was, and, and it still is an unknown problem. It's yes. nothing like anything people have ever dealt with. And you've dealt with some of the nuances, which we'll get into, like the, you know, issues with ischemia and various factors. And they didn't know if they should put you on a type of ventilator that increases the pressure or decreases the pressure. Or, and, and it was just, I think, you know, it was great that you were the only one they were focused on but it was almost very difficult because now they know a lot more yes Correct. Um, yes Correct. there were there were many things about the timing of of greg going into the hospital you know he, it was great that he was there early because he had all that attention and really gave us an opportunity number one to see him unlike many patients today and also um to have numerous conversations with doctors and we really had like their sole attention on him so we were able to talk to them a number of times, uh, nurses throughout the day. Um, and then obviously the unfortunate things are that there were things that they didn't know about it, like, you know, the vent and being on pressors that affected Greg's hands. And, and now he's going to have 
some amputa- amputations so, in the yeah, future. This Tell is us about that. That must have been that. like just so difficult. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I really kind of really hasn't hit me that much yet. Um, it's going to hit me a lot worse when I have the first surgery coming up on the 19th of this month. Um, a little bit of an exploratory concept of pulling the, uh, you know, the black off my fingers and exploring what viable tissue is there, what they can save, what they can't, um, the procedures that are going to go, that we're going to go through. Um, it's, it's, it's a little scary at that, yeah. um, of unknown. And I really, the focus I've had through this whole thing is dude, I'm alive. I, I mean, Love that. when the, the whole point for me, I was on dialysis. I had kidney failure. I had liver failure. Lung I collapse. Was, my was at a hundred percent. I'm sorry. Lung collapse. Yeah. Four lung collapse. Yeah. Is, it was what happened. So chest tubes and everything else. I mean, I have a hundred percent function on everything right now. And you, I, as of this morning, I am the only person that is that was on the vent that walked out of St. Joe's. Nobody else has done it. Um, they, I don't know if they've. No, okay. that's just happened oh, this sure. morning. Okay, you didn't walk I, out yet. No, no, I know that, but I was going to say people might have been on the vent for short periods of time. About thirty days. Prolonged. Yeah, I think that's it's more for a what prolonged period of time thinking. that you know. Yeah. But other people got, went to nursing homes. Mm-hmm. They had massive sores. They had. Uh, um, you mean they, they had permanent damage that was going on. They had amputations. I was the only person that 100% on my own got up and walked out that door. And I love that footage so, of you walking out and all the, I saw that on the news and I didn't it know it was you. It's interesting because I kind <laughs> oh, of, really? you know, it's funny. We have a lot of mutual friends that we would be, oh yeah, I have a friend at St. Joe's. I'm like, oh, is, is it Greg? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, I don't, you know, when you got released, it was on, I don't know, some channel four or seven news. And I was like, oh my God, I, I wonder if this is, so I called up John, our mutual friend, Landsberger. Yeah. I'm like, John, was, was that Greg who just walked out? And he was so happy. So, I mean, and it's true. One of my really good friends, she's an emergency room doctor at Elmhurst, which is ground zero of coronavirus in New York. Right. And what she was telling me was that at Elmhurst, if you're on the vent six, seven, eight, nine days, they're not keeping you on the vent because they needed the vent for someone else. So, oh my gosh. Honestly, I mean, I think, you know, I know uh, there's been like 1%, doctor told you there's a 1% chance of survival, but at the time that you were there, I would put that at a lower than 1% because first of all, people didn't know what they were doing, you know, and, um, you know, I think it, it, the, the, what happened was with kind of keeping, you know, doing the lockdown and stuff they really reduce the burden on the hospital so that they could pay attention to patients like yourself. And it's really wonderful that I'm so happy for you. And your energy, as I was telling you, I love your positivity. The two of you guys are just like beaming with energy. It's not like, oh my God, you know, I I was on my deathbed, like literally a few weeks ago, but the energy and, you know, you have to learn how to walk again, right? I mean, that's what, you know, you have to learn to do so many things and you're just so positive. I learned how to walk. I, I learned how to walk again. I learned how to swallow. I learned how to chew. Um, I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I, I wanted to mention something about the positivity that you're talking about and the energy, because we have really, we're not necessarily religious, either of us. But I will tell you that this experience has really allowed both of us to open our minds so much to the, the force of energy, the force of activity. Spiritually, it is, a, it is the most incredibly powerful force when it comes together. And um, from, from Greg, when he was sleeping for 31 days, sleeping, quote unquote. I, took a nap. Was, I like that. I, his good. body was fighting. That's positive. Sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> but we really, his sister Stephanie and I, she came to stay with me. And as you know, this, this 
virus really delivers great news and then it, it hits you with a ton of bricks. You can think you're on the positive trajectory and then suddenly later it just tells you, you know, we get a call saying he's got a vandalism or he's got a fever and he's packed in ice. Okay, now he's lower on the vent. Oh, well now he isn't because he just had two pneumothoraxes, lung collapses. And if we rode that wave, the way that the wave truly felt, I don't know that we would have stayed as positive, but we just made sure that even on the bad news, we would turn on music and we would dance. We would ask our village, we need everyone to stay positive, toast him, think about him, pray for him, meditate, whatever it is that you need to do. And honestly, when he came out, he heard so much of how positivity sort of led his way that now in his own chapter, he feels a bit of the responsibility. And I, don't, I think it's an honor, actually, honey, I would yeah. say more than anything else to keep that positivity going for, to, to continue on. You just- And it's an honor for me, honestly, to speak to you guys, because that's what I really, I think like, you know, obviously right now we're in times of major, there's so much going on. And uh, to just hear, um, you know, the energy that you're, you're beaming with and the positivity and the support, the love that that's around you, because it does take a village. and. You know, I, I saw your Ellen show and one of the things that I really respected was how much kudos, how much, um, you know, you, you not only to AJ and Stephanie, your sister, who is really involved, but to the doctors and nurses, because they're oh, really, absolutely. yeah, so that's, that's so, you know, honorable in a sense, because a lot of people just forget about all of these people who've been with them and helped them to get to this point. And it really does take a village. It's, mm-hmm. it's really interesting. Um, I hold them so near and dear to my heart, the doctors and nurses, oh, yeah. that I would not, not be here without them at all. And it's every aspect of, of who is in that, that hospital. In fact, you know, I'm a guy that doesn't take too well. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm much more of a giver than a taker. And I kind of feel guilty at times when, yeah. when I, I receive, I have received the largest outpouring of love and support from my village. My sister put together a GoFundMe and, you know, the money aspect, I mean, it's, it was uh, a, a large, a large sum of money I, I, that was donated to me. However, the amount of people was over 1200 people donated people. I don't even know. Right. And it, that's, that's what, that's what is so empowering to me that, you know, I, I, I was on a mission to not fail. And so when I was invited into the rehab center and you have to be invited on the fifth floor, not everybody gets up there. And I was invited and I get emotional every single time. I did this on the Ellen show. I, um, I looked at my doctor and I said to him, I won't let you down. And I killed it. Oh, I'm sure you did. It's, you know, I was so far ahead of the game that six weeks ago, dude, I, I almost died. <laughs> so today being a hundred percent just short of my fingers, I mean, it's a small price to pay for giving my life back. Yeah. Yeah. I will say too that um, when you're talking about the village and the nurses and the doctors, at St. Joe's, I've heard a number of nightmare stories in other places where doctors all don't communicate. And, you know, when you're a patient or an advocate and you say, okay, well, this doctor said X and they'll go, okay, well, that's what that doctor said. Well, this is what I'm telling you. And there's just never a coordination. I will tell you, or at times I have heard, I should say. In this case, there was so much communication. There was so much support between each other. They all were a team. The nurses were part of that team. They communicated to us like, in this unbelievable um, flow, we never felt a miss. We never felt like we were missing out on information or not being told something. And I have to say that part of the village, that help, that, that care that he was getting was so incredible because we couldn't do anything. We yeah. were helpless. We were sitting at home hoping and praying that he knew that we were there for him. For it is people. hard. It is yeah. so hard when you, and you know, as a family member, and a loved one, it's so hard. You want to do something. You can't, you can't even visit. And, you know, for you, even though you were intubated and sedated, I really do believe, and I'm not religious or 
spiritual. I don't, but, but I do believe that family energy really impacts outcome. I really do believe that. And I think, again, part of your energy right now, I think has to do with your sister and AJ and the people around you as well. And I mean, uh, again, it's, uh, I'm on a mission not to fail. And you're not going to. It's, it's, um, like, no, no, I know you're no <laughs> but there's no chance. No way. Um, Failure I mean, is going to fail. Drive, not you. My drive as a person. I, I mean, I, I have that. I live life. I've always lived life every single day um, with no regrets. And, you know, I've always been a good person and always um, loved twice as hard as I've been loved. Um, and it really came back to me tenfold. Yeah. On the, on the, just the love and support that not only, you know, my two angels, which is AJ and my sister, um, but the people around me that, I mean, they stepped up and they have given, they've given so much to us from every week they're delivering food to the house and their, their, their calls and their, I mean, just everything. It just, it is so overwhelming. Um, I'm the most fortunate person in the world to have those people in my life. And I'm even luckier to have the team that I had at the hospital yeah. that gave me my life. That is the most fo in the forefront. I cannot, could have done this without them. What do you have to say? I think, what do you want people to know? You've talked about a lot. You've overcome great adversity um, with amazing energy. And it's not like you've gone unscathed. I mean, losing your fingers, that's a big deal. I know you're, you're, you're keeping it really positive, but that's, that's, that's a, that's a major. Well, my, my life has definitely changed forever wow. in that respect. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I'm a huge skier. Like I, like I told you before, I ski 70 to hundred days a year. Um, I ski all over the world. Uh, my home base is mammoth. Um, I have a home up there. I sp we spend a ton of time at, you know, in mammoth. That's a big part of our life. Uh, I also, you know, I'm the big, big guy driving, driving cars and motorcycles and mountain biking. And, you know, that's, that's changed a little bit in regards to how I will do things. I will do all those things. I know you're going to do it. We got to do a run together in mammoth. Night when I, it all I, opens. I don't know if I can keep up with you, but. I, I'm, I'm like, I, want, I don't want to do the avalanche thing that you were telling me. Why don't you tell everyone about the avalanche? This was not the first time you've been in the news, right? So <laughs> this, so not only was I on the Ellen show right now, and I was also on the, on the Today Show just a few weeks ago as well. And prior to being on the Today Show, uh, this was the second time I was on the Today Show. In 06... Oh um, I out an avalanche on a run called Climax. It was 100 feet wide, 650 feet long. In fact, it was April 17th, the day after my 40th birthday in 06. And um, we dropped in, uh, there, was a, there was a big storm, three foot storm. Um, 11 inches was really, really light on that particular night before. We dropped in on, on Climax, one of my buddies, was uh, I skied down as with a video camera. His girlfriend, now his wife, um, went down first because she wasn't as fast as us. I dropped in, my buddy Eric dropped behind me, three turns in, the entire thing breaks loose, and we outran it at 70 miles an hour. So we appeared on the Today Show <laughs> that next morning. I've skied that, by the way, with my daughter. That's, yeah, that's, yeah I mean, that's a good run. I ski it. And Every year on that date at that time, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon oh on April 7th, you will find me on Climax. Oh my God. <laughs> Where's your favorite was, place to ski outside of Mammoth? Uh, Chamonix, France. Okay. Oh, really? Oh, that's cool. Yes. Yeah. I've never skied Europe. I, you know, I just, just a West Coast. So, we so got some good stuff out here though. So like, we're lucky. I know it's my thing it's with my kids. I love, they're really good skiers. Now they're like much better than I am, but it's, it's <laughs> my favorite thing. It's such a, it's such a, my, cool. it's my, it's my biggest passion in life. How are your ski buddies doing? Did any of them get really sick or are all of them okay and healthy? How many, uh, one, of them, one of them got, 
sicker than I did, but he was, um, he was definitely compromised uh, with one lung. So compromise. And he's still in Munich. Um, in, we've heard that he was, that he was in, is in rehab. Um, there, there isn't really a big open line of communication, unfortunately. Um, there's been some challenges with that, but needless to say, um, he's alive at this point. Okay. Well, I wish him well. I wish him well. And I'm looking forward to, uh, talking with you after your next European ski trip, <laughs> hopefully in the new year. Well, well, let's ski together before that. Oh yeah. I would love that. <laughs> I want to thank you guys so much. This has been really, as I said, an honor for me to have an opportunity to speak to both of you, um, hear your story. I think it's inspirational. It's positive. You went through so many challenging periods and, I'm so happy that you're healthy and I wish you luck on your uh, next Thank steps, you. which will be, you know, managing and hopefully reconstructing the hands. I think I know the surgeon you're going to, he's very, very good. So um, I, uh, I'm praying for you. He's and, in your backyard. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, hope that, yeah, and I'm, he's going to do a great job and uh, I wish you nothing so, but the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there's one thing I, I, I do want to add that um, the real message that I want to relay out in the public, there's a lot going on today. There's, you know, with the riots and everything else. Um, and this virus is no joke. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people, I think the stats are 40% uh, which is a scarier thought with the concept of how people are around with no masks and irresponsibility. And it's not about protecting, it's about protecting others. You as individuals absolutely have the right to live your life the way you choose to. You do not have the right to put other people in danger. Yeah. And really, you know, my message is be socially responsible. And if, if you can't help yourself, help others. Yeah. 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 And I think we're, I think this is hopefully, I know we're going through a temporary pause in this message, but uh, I do think there will be, my personal opinion is there will be a long lasting change. And I think the way that people respect their own health and other people's health. And it's something that, you know, had been really taken for granted. So hopefully you know, we'll, we'll come out. So they, you know, they, yeah. the, um, the, the part that was, was cha is challenging right now is you have all these protesters and everybody that, um, are out, out in the streets and they're not socially distancing. Yeah. They're not even wearing masks. Most of them. Yeah. So even the police, officers police officers, masks. that, yeah. that to me is give a representation of, of really what should be. Yeah. And that's not happening. You know, the fact is, a week from now, two weeks from now, there's going to be a huge spike in, in positive cases. Yeah, for sure. I hope not. I mean, <laughs> no, there will be. I mean, th this is like, you know, there, there will be. And uh, hopefully it'll be, you know, tempered and, you know, I hope so. cause a lot more harm. So yeah. I hope so. And I, I, w I wish that everybody takes heed and, and get, gets responsible and, you know, look at my example. Yeah. It doesn't happen to everybody. Yeah. Young, healthy, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of people think that it's just related to your age and other yeah. factors. So oh. um, I think the personal responsibility of everyone is going to be key to, you know, getting us through this process. So yep. agreed. Thanks, Don. Well, thank you again. And I hope that, uh, again, everything goes well with your upcoming surgery, your rehab, your ski trips. Okay. And enjoy, uh, you know, your new life. And for our, the next chapter. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and you have a great, great village around you. Very thank nice. you. Doc, we'll be in touch. All right. And for our viewers and listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please leave us your comment, any suggestions, and we look forward to seeing you soon.